We should have faith in what God says He is, in how God says He works, and all that. If we have faith in them, we will be able to persevere. We also talked about the principle of loyalty, that was the very principle. So, over there, we learned that as Christians, we should be loyal to the faith that we have. Uh, we remain. Uh, we knew that uh, an article which a professor wrote them, that professor said that every human being has a price and only, and the difference is, sorry, he says every human being has a price. The only difference is the price as, at which we are willing to surrender two, our convictions. Two more, yeah, two our convictions may differ, the arguments are out there, and if the price was right, we will be willing to cross certain boundaries. So that was what the professor said, and he said that in this era, the principle of loyalty is outdated. Yeah, individual friends. Whatever, any price that uh, is good for us, we should just go in for it, and that should be the But uh, as Christians, we learned that we should be loyal to, to the faith that we have for us to be able to endure. So in difficult times, we shouldn't be loyal. We should try and stay loyal as much as loyal to, as we can. Then the next principle that we talked about was the principle of knowledge, having the right knowledge of God. So over there is the knowledge of God, his nature, his capabilities, and most importantly, his promises for us, his keen for our ability to endure in times of trouble. It gets to some point in a Christian's life where no amount of words from a colleague or even a preacher will be enough to sustain or keep you from trusting in the promises of God. And in those circumstances, so only now, the things that we will yeah. commit into our minds and into our hearts and lead them strongly are the things that will be able to sustain us in those times of difficulty. So as Christians, if we want to know how to be, uh, how to endure, if we want to get this virtue of endurance, then it means we must get the right knowledge of God. And if we do not have the right knowledge of God, we will be able to endure to some point in time then we will give up because of our lack of knowledge. We also look at the principle of consistency. So, at that principle, we said that as um, Christians, new era Christians, we should be consistent because we realize that um, most Christians now are not consistent when it comes to their belief. When things are right and when things are going on what we are, we also want to do what is right. But when things get difficult, then we try to find ways of um, doing the wrong part, just find it. So we look at some cliches that we use, that at times we say that God will at times, at times we say that um, it must be the will of the Lord because it looks right to me. At times we say that we don't see any wrong, anything wrong with what we are doing. But deep down we know that what we are doing is not what God will pass us. So we should be consistent as Christians. We also look at a sixth principle, which is the principle of determination and long suffering. So we got to know over there that as Christians, if we will be able to endure times of difficulties, then we should have these two uh, abilities to uh, suffer long. We should develop a tough skin. We should try to find ways of adapting to difficult situations. Because we, we, we read from scripture that Things get difficult as time goes on. At times, um, things will get difficult and we may meet difficult times. But if we do not have this virtue of determination and we do not have the ability to suffer long, we are going to give up at the end. Then the last principle that we looked at last week was the principle of calmness and contentment. We look at that principle while we read 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 4, verse 8. And over there, Paul said that he had prayed three times over something, and uh, he, God told him that he, he was not getting a response. God told him uh, his grace is sufficient for him. But Paul was delighted that he was content with the situation that he found himself in, and he was able to endure that. Although he didn't receive the answer that he wanted, he was able to endure that because he to the end. So these were the, these are the seven principles we were able to look at at a level one basic principles. So today we are continuing with level two. And level two I've named it the level of empirical analysis. 
a level of empirical adequacy. So at this level, we look at certain key biblical characters that were able to stand their ground and wait on the Lord through times of difficulties by applying some of the principles we have already mentioned in level one. So this level of lessons also seeks to look at various promises and assurances we have from God. His promises to see us through, to give us the strength for the journey, to sustain, equip, and fortify us, to be able to stand firmly for Him, and to be able to persist, persevere, and endure to the end. So that's the second level of this lesson, level two. So uh, in scripture, we know of a lot of, um, we read a lot about a lot of men and women who were able to persevere to, to the end. So we don't have much time, so we can't look at all of them. So we will look at a few of them, which we are very much familiar with them. So the first one we will look at is Job. So Job, we will read some few verses over there. And uh, we know these stories. We know them um, right from infancy. From um, Sunday Bible class, the one over there. Uh, Sunday school, yes. We know from Sunday school these stories and how we are told of these stories at times make us uh, think that they are just stories that uh, we are being told. We do not um, appreciate these uh, parts of the Bible very well. So this morning, um, we will look at Job and we will try to put Job in our context or we will try to fit in Job's context. We will try to uh, bridge that and not just read them as uh, stories. So uh, let me give a quick, uh, a simple overview of the whole book of Job. So Job starts chapter 1. Uh, Job was a righteous man. Job lived uh, to please God. And because of that, he had a lot of um, possessions. He had a wonderful family. He had servants who worked for him. And he had everything that he wanted. And he was faithful to God. He served God very well. And as at that time, the theology that most of them had was do good and be blessed. We do bad, then we are cursed. So that was the, the mindset of almost everyone at that time. So if you do good, you will be blessed, if you do bad, you will be So Job had uh, done his best to do good at all times. He was making sacrifices to God because he thought that his children could have sinned at a certain point in time. So he was doing everything he could um, as a righteous man um, who would please God. So um, it got to a time where Satan through his, uh, uh, he was roaming and he went to where God and his angels had met and some conversations went on. So finally, finally, things began to get difficult for Job. So he started losing his family, he lost everything. He lost everything that he had. That was, that's chapter one. And, and in chapter two, Satan challenges God again and Job is now losing his health. He's losing everything that he has. So, chapter 2, I think verse 9, that's where um, the wife comes in and says what she said. Then, in chapter 2, verse 11, his three friends from far away came, then they had a conversation with Job up to chapter 38. So, yeah, up to chapter 38. Then, from chapter 38, Job takes his case to God and he has a back, back and forth um, kind of a conversation with God, where God takes him through time and space, how he created the universe and all that. Then, chapter 42, Job retracts what he says about God, and God blesses Job back again and gets everything that he wants had. So, this is the entire story of Job. Now, let us look at certain um, specific aspects of Job's life. So first of all, Job had everything. Job had everything and he was living right. So things were right and 
This was a challenge that Job threw to God. Sorry, Satan threw to God. That you have protected him, you've formed a hedge around him. So why won't Job be faithful to you? So um, God had to remove the hedge that he had formed around Job and to expose Job so that Job could be vulnerable, so that anything could happen to Job. So that was when um, things began to fall apart for Job. So Job began to lose his work and all that. Um, we may not be able to appreciate this world because maybe at this level we don't have work, we don't have jobs that we do. But um, those of us who are here who are working, um, just pause for a moment and think of how things would be if probably right after a year you have to get a call and you have to be told that your, your, your contract or whatever has been terminated. Then after that, then you get another call, um, your house is on fire, then you get another call that um, you've lost all your siblings. Just take a moment and think of the possibility, some of the things that could happen. Do you think that after these three calls, you'll be able to still hold on firm to God? Do you think that after this, and let's, let's listen to what Job said. After he had all these um, coming in, Job chapter 1 verse um, 13. Okay, so 13, now to think back. Um, let's jump to 22. Job 1 verse 22. Maybe you can let someone read. Job did not send. Amen. Amen. So after he had lost his source of living, after he had lost everything, his servant, after he had lost all his ten children, scripture tells us that through all this he did not sin. And also he did not what? Blame God. Sometimes things get difficult and we, we begin to wonder whether it's, it's true that God is really the one in control of everything and we, we begin to have some thoughts and at times we even some people blaspheme against God because um, now we have some people who claim that they were once Christians and they believe in God and uh, they had some challenges and they expected God to help them and God did not help them so because of that they are saying there is no God. We have people, I know people like that who, who have faced difficulties and because of that they lost their faith totally. But Job 1 22 tells us that after all these things, Job did not blame God. And um, back in Sunday school, our teachers, when they are teaching the day, they, they stress on the, the woman, Job's wife. That um, she she was enjoying when things were right, but when things got difficult, he, uh, she told Job to, to curse God and let so that he would die. So at times we criticized the woman, but I want to appreciate what she felt um, last year December when a woman in a local congregation lost a child. The woman is. Should be, she should be in her 70s or her 80s. And her child was 47 years, 47 years old. On the regular day, the woman is a very funny woman and she's very cheerful and all that. But after she lost her child and we went to visit her, you could see the pain and anguish that she was going through. So that was when this struck me that. Look at how cheerful this woman is. And one child that she lost has changed everything for her. And she has been crying throughout. She has been crying throughout. So I imagine a tenfold of that what the one was going through as at that time. And you can't bear it. It's difficult. For just only on that aspect, ten children. To lose 10 children at the same time. Most of us wouldn't have been survived to get to chapter 2. We would have just 
and then everything at chapter 1. But the woman was able to endure. I'm not saying what she did at chapter 2 is the best, but at least we should appreciate her a bit some more. But she was able, she is a woman and she was able to endure. And she wasn't able to endure until the time that the only person she had was also about to die. That was when she made that statement. So in times of difficulties, Job was able to stand his ground and he did not blame God for that. The second thing is that Job suffered for some time. He suffered for about a year. That, so because of Job chapter 7 verse 3, he talks about suffering in months. So some scholars tell us that he suffered for some months or probably even up to a year. So uh, everything came back to, to him. So at chapter 2 verse 11, Job had lost his children, his source of income, his servants, and everything that he had. And now he has um, source all over his body. So his friends, the Bible called them three friends, although later on we get to find out there is another young uh, chap over there. But his three friends come to him and they don't speak for seven days. And they are all sitting there, no one sees. Until Job begins the conversation. So Job begins by saying this. Um, this is what I know. That God is just. He runs the universe, universe on, on just principles. So if God is just and he runs the universe on just principles, why is it that a good person is suffering? So that was the opening of the entire conversation. So these three friends, Eliphaz and Zophar and Dodda. So Job speaks, then the other one responds, then Job speaks, the other response, Job speaks, then the third responds. So all these friends were also under the impression that do good and be blessed, do bad and be cursed. And since we see that Job, you are being cursed, then it means you've done something wrong. So aside all the um, things that Job lost. He is also facing wrong accusations as well. That you have done something wrong. But Job also knew that he hasn't done anything wrong. So he took the fourth young person, that is Eli, to, to discern this. That yes, it's true that God is just. It's true that if you do good, you bless you bad and you bless. But he continues to explain to them that it's not as straightforward as it is. Sometimes um, God is just to know that we could do good, but still things could be difficult for us. Things could go wrong for us. So um, after enemies uh, said the Zenjo now went straight to God and he started having that back and forth with God. That was where God showed him that. I am the creator of the universe where we're human. I was creating this. Uh, how, do you know how this happens? Do you know how this happens? So God had to take him right from the beginning of time to the present before Job got to understand that things are not we, we are finite. We are finite. We don't know everything. So things are not as or things don't go as always as we expect them to go. There are sometimes we could do right. And so the wrong will come to us. So um, that is a brief overview of how uh, things went on in Job's life. Then later on, we, were, we, we, we found out that uh, Job had everything that he was everything that one he once had. So some principles that we could learn from, from Job, we, we see that in times of difficulties and all that, um, he was loyal. Job was loyal to God. He trusted in God. Um, he suffered long. And he had a sound knowledge about God and how God works. Although it wasn't that problem, but at least he had some knowledge. Because at the point we read that he did not charge God with anything wrong. He did not charge God with any wrong. And in level 3, we will talk about this. A bit when we talk about the sovereignty of God. So that is 
briefly about two. So the next character that we will look at, of course, is Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know this story also very well from Sunday school. So um, let's read Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Daniel 1, 3 and 4. And let's listen to the description that uh, the Bible gives to these four young men. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. Microphone. Microphone. Three. Microphone. Then the king ordered Ashkenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family. Okay, please. Um, we will take from that one, we'll take them one after the other. So, uh, this is the point that I want to make. The king, uh, Daniel uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were in, in, in Judah. And after that time, um, it was this king. Um, Babylon had taken over Israel and Israel, so they were the, they were the ones ruling over Israel. So this king ordered that they should go into the Israelites and select men with these qualities that uh, he is about to, to mention. So the first quality is that they should please read uh, the first one. Again. The, then the king ordered us, as well as the chief of his officials to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family. So the first criteria is that you should be from a royal family. Please continue. And of the nobles. So you should be a very noble man. You. You should be young. In whom was no defects. So you should not have any defects on you. Who were good looking. So you should be good looking as well before you go. So you should be intelligent in every branch of wisdom. So you should be very, very intelligent. So we, we can do that since these four men were selected to be part of the, the number of people that came at the question, then we could say that these people had all these qualities that we have mentioned. They are very intelligent, they are good looking, they do not have or any other thing on them. So um, we read this and I, I, I just compare it to our uh, contemporary world. So it's like most of us here, we, uh, we are young, some of, we are good looking, we are intelligent and all that. So we, we get the opportunity to be called to somewhere, to a higher place to, to serve. Somewhere we wish we could go so that uh, we could serve over there. But something happens at Daniel 1, I think 8. Daniel 1, 8. Please read for us. Verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice of food or with the wine which he drank. Okay, thank you. So he said that Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the drinks that will be given to, to him. So over here we, we see the principle of consistency in Daniel's life. Daniel was from a different place and over there the, the, the principles and the teachings that he had received was somehow against this kind of food and this kind of drink which was uh, to be given to him. There are, I found out three different reasons why um, it's possible that Daniel rejected um, the food and the drink, but we wouldn't go into that. But um, the principle is this. Daniel has been called to a higher place to be set. And the first thing he is doing is maintaining his integrity. The first thing he is doing is being constant to the conviction that he has. That he is not going to defile himself with some of these things. Sometimes when we, we get the opportunity to, to serve or to do some things, then maybe there will be a small caveat that, oh, it might be you get back to your have to do this for us. Are we able to, to, to maintain, are we able to endure and not soil ourselves or we just go in for it? Do we stay consistent through our times of difficulty 
or we just fall for it when the opportunity comes knocking at our door. So much that Daniel was consistent and he ignored the food and he requested for something different, staying consistent to what he knew and what he had been taught. So at the end, we read from scripture that um, God um, finally, finally, Daniel had to break the law of pray to God and they had to capture him and put him into the lion's den. So imagine this, um, I, I don't know the number of lines that we have in Ghana here, but let's let it, just an imagination. Um, you, you do something and it's, in, it's consistent with the teachings of the Bible and you are caught. It's either you recount your faith or you are going to be killed by any means. Let's just think about this. Will, will we be able to endure to the end? Or will we just give in and save our lives? The same principle was what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also put into practice. When they were also about to be uh, put into the fire, they also stayed true to their confession. They were loyal. And last week we got to explain the point of of us not being all knowing and of us being limited. So they said that even if God does not save us from this fire, we are not going to bow to, 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 to the whatever that they said that they should bow to. So over there, the people, these four people that we mentioned, were able to stay loyal to, to the end and not just give in. They were able to endure up to the end. We have a lot of biblical characters that we will talk about. We have the life of Paul, how he suffered a lot of times. Paul was doing a lot of things for God, but still he had some challenges that he wished God would take away from him. But still, those challenges were there, but he had no other choice than to continue to persevere. And he was able to do it. And if you read about what some of the things that Paul went through, it's, it's quite amazing. But through all those things, he was able to persevere to the end. So we could look at the life of Stephen and Abraham and Ruth and all those other biblical characters that were, that were able to live and endure up to their last prayer. So before we move on to the next level, I would like to read to you um, the biography of um, everyone. She is Annie Johnson Clement. Annie Johnson Clement. And her biography was written by Roland Bingham. Um, it's a 60 page book that I have tried to um, summarize it into about two or three pages. So please um, follow me with your undivided attention as I read her biography. And at the end, we will look at how she will get it. It says that Annie was born on Christmas Eve in the year 1866 in the little town of Maryland, New Jersey, to Elder and Jim Johnson. They welcomed that Christmas present as, as the greatest ever gift. Annie lost the mother during the delivery of her younger sister when Annie was three. Their father, who was suffering from an incurable disease, took their children to war with the widow of an old army comrade who had been killed. And they stayed there for three years. They then went further to stay with the flames a little by the intervention of their aunt Susan. Mr. and Mrs. Flint were two Christians and now reigned in their home. The two girls were taken right to their hearts and now as though they were their own flesh and blood. The daily training was thorough, both in the Christian and domestic sphere. When she was 14, the family went to Camden, New Jersey, and there the two girls continued their schooling. There was nothing special to mark the years that came by in that time. She was very fond of reading and made good use of the character father's life. She was blessed with the ability of coming up with brilliantly written poems. Whether by nature or through her early Christian experience, 
domestic lady was generally disposed to be cheerful and optimistic. She looked on the bright side of life and she was quite fond of it and was able to get as much enjoyment out of life as possible. She had a generous nature and was ever ready to share what she had with others and ever more willing to grant favors than to accept them. Finishing her high school, she spent one year as a normal teacher and then had a position offered to her. It was a great temptation to begin earning money, but her adopted mother, but her adopted mother was failing in health and had had one slight stroke. Anne felt that she was really needed at home, so she started teaching in the primary class in the same school that she had attended as a girl. According to her contract with the normal school, she, she taught for three years. Though in the early second year, arthritis showed itself. She tried several doctors in turn, but it still grew worse until it became difficult for her to walk at all, and she had to work to finish out the third year. After that, she was obliged to give, give up her work and then followed three years of increasing helplessness. The death of both her doctor period within a few months left the two girls again alone. There was little money in the bank and twice and the twice orphan children had come to a real rescue place in their lives. Her old parents had been taken from her in childhood and her foster parents would pass away. Her one sister was all too real and struggling to meet her own situation bravely, with her hand pushed through her bent fingers and held by swollen joints. She wrote first without any thought that it might be an avenue of ministry or that it would bring her return that might help her in her support. Her verses provide a solace for her long, for her in long hours of suffering. But then she began the name of hand lettered cards and gifts books. Some of her writings became popular. Two hard publishers printed some of her, some of her work and it helped her to get her foot on the first round of ladder support. It gave her the larger mission of possibly securing openings through some of the magazines by which her poems would be a wider blessing and at the same time bring some little return that would minister on her own personally. In the later, in her later years, nine soft pillows were carefully arranged on her bed for use in protecting the explicitly sensitive pain smitten body from the normal contact of the head water. So distressing it was her prayer to recline in the hope of rest at night. She suffered from cancer. She had multiple bed sores and became incontinent as well. If anyone would have been excused for writing dark and depressing lyrics, it would have been a woman like Tiny Johnson Jones. Instead, she focused on Jesus and the lyrics that she was inspired to write were hope and faith. This twice often attracted the continent woman who also had cancer with her gift of writing was able to encourage and strengthen Christians worldwide. One of her last poems she wrote before she died was a sensational one which she entitled He Giveth More Grace and it was later converted into a hymn. That was a life gift by Annie Johnson Flint. And that's, that's how she, she wrote the poem. She says that he given more grace when the burden grew greater. He sent more strength when the labors increased. To what affliction he added mercy, to multiply trials, to multiply peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has filled, then the day is half done. When we have met the end of our further resources, our father's whole giving is only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power no boundaries no one to man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And this is what John Newton also had to say after he had almost drowned in the sea and he had a shipwreck and a lot of things were happening in his life. This is what John Newton said. He said, Be born unbelief, my Savior is near, and for my relief, 
will surely appear by prayer when we rest home, and he will perform with Christ in the vessel. I smile at my tongue, though that be my way, since he is my guide, it is mine to obey, it is his to provide. Though systems be broken and creatures be filled, the words he has spoken shall surely prevail. His love in time past forbids me to think he will leave me at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good pleasure to help me quite true. Why should I complain of want or distress? Temptation or pain, he teach me no less. The heirs of salvation I know from his word, through my tribulations, must follow their God. Since all that I need shall work for my good, the bitter is sweet, the medicine food, though painful and present, it will cease before long. And then, oh, how pleasant the conqueror's song. To one that affliction he added his mercy, to multiply trials. So these people have been able to live and their lives were difficult at certain points. They had to face a lot of challenges, physical, material, emotional, spiritual, and from all different angles. But they were able to endure up to the end. And if that is so, then this is what Isaiah tells us. It says that do not fear for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. This is what God is telling us this morning that we should not be afraid. That is His promise in Scripture. That in difficult times He's going to uphold us with His righteous right hand and He's going to help and He's going to strengthen us. So that is the second level, the level of empirical adequacy. So we move on to the third level. That is the level of experiential relevance, the level of experiential relevance. So at the third level, we seek to pull all the principles that we have in the one perspective. We will look at the examples and the empirical evidence provided for us in level two that we just completed. And we will try to provide practical ways that we can stand firm that can help us to stand firm in whatever situation we may find ourselves in. So we have now looked at the basic principles that we need as Christians for level one and for level two. We have looked at some evidences we have in scripture about how some people found themselves in extremely difficult situations and God was able to come through for them. So we know this, so how does it play in our lives. How, how do we go about it when it, it is to come? When difficult times are to come? How, what should we do? What can we do so that we will be able to endure to, to the end as Christians? So at this level, I have two major points here. So the first one is knowledge and the second one which was pointed out last week by Brother Moses as a social support for the church. So the first one is knowledge, then the second one is the church or social support. So we have said that it, it gets to some difficult points in our life where the only thing or the major thing that can sustain us is our knowledge of God is our knowledge of how God works, it's our knowledge of God's plan for us, and it's our knowledge of all these things. So, if you have the right knowledge, it will be able to sustain us greatly. That, that would be the first line of um, defense for us if we are to, to meet difficulties. So, under knowledge, I have four points here. So the first one we have to know is the principle of sovereignty or transcendence. The second one is the principle of concurrence of humanity. And these two are somehow linked. These two are somehow linked. So this is the principle of sovereignty. So sovereignty teaches that Christians, so, sorry, the sovereignty in the Christian teaching is that God is supreme. Is a supreme and sorry. So
So twenty in the Christian teaching teaches that God is supreme and has authority over all things. So that is the first point of sovereignty. God is supreme and has control over everything. And the second point is that because of this power that God has, He has the absolute right and the full authority that allows Him to do whatever He desires. So that is the first thing that we should know. Christians uh, teach us that the Bible teaches us that God is a sovereign God and He has all power in this universe. And because of that, He is allowed to do whatever that He wants. So we will read a lot of scriptures. We have Psalm 115, verse 3, Psalm 135, verse 6, Isaiah 46, 10, Daniel 4, 34, 35, Job 15, 5, then Romans 9, 18, 21. Psalm 115, verse 3, Psalm 135. God, so please everyone can read here. Psalm 115 verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Amen. Amen. The next one, Psalm 135 verse 6. 135 verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. Amen. Amen. So let's suggest an expansion of the first one that whatever, whatever God pleases, He does. So in times of difficulties, this is what should come into our minds first, that God is sovereign. Just as in the case of Job, we, we shouldn't think that if we do right, we will be blessed. It's, it's, it's like a direct proportion, something that's always constant. It will happen that you will do right, but God will choose that you will have to pass through some difficult times. So God chooses whatever He wants to do, and He, he does it. No one can um, speak back to Him. As Job tried and God gave him a 60 question. So Job couldn't answer one. So God does what pleases Him. But if you think of this, this could be quite scary. Uh, but what gives us hope in this is that God is a holy God, and although He does whatever pleases Him, He does it with, 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 with a purpose. So let's read Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28 should give us some comfort that it's true that God does whatever pleases Him. But we have uh, hope that He has good plans for us. That's why He does whatever He does. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To God. Okay. So we know that God causes all things to work together for His good. So the first thing is that God causes all things. So whatever difficulty that we might be facing, we should know that God is sovereign. And I will explain. And it doesn't also mean that we are not responsible in any way. But we should also have it in mind that God is suffering, suffering sorry, and He causes whatever that uh, He pleases. But He does it according to His own purpose. And His holy nature makes sure that the purpose that He has is a good purpose for us. So please continue reading. To those who love God, yes. to those who are called according to His purpose. Thank you. So he, 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 he does it with a good intention for one, those who love God, and for those who are called according to His purpose. So Jeremiah 29, verse 11, you know this scripture also, it also affirms this, that uh, he, he, he knows the plan that He has for us, and we are plans of good and all that. So we should, in difficult times, we should know that God is sovereign. God chooses whatever He wants to do according to His own purpose. So it doesn't matter whether you are doing right or wrong. You could do right and still find difficulties at some point in your life. That is God's doing, and He has a purpose for that. The second uh, point and the knowledge and the three that I will talk about is the principle of concurrence. The principle of concurrence. But before I talk about that, I will read briefly something that we 
when Uden wrote in his systematic theology, he writes about deism. D-E-I-S-M. So he says that deism generally holds the view that God created the universe and is far greater than the universe. So deism, in deism, they believe in the transcendence or in the sovereignty of God. God has a power in everything. He continues to say that some deists also agree that God has moral standards and will ultimately hold people accountable on the day of judgment. So these also believe this. But they deny God's present involvement in the world, thus leaving no place for his immanence in the created order. Rather, God is viewed as the divine clockmaker who wound up the clock of creation at the beginning, but then he left it to run on its own. This is what we are saying. He says that as um, deists, deists are people, they, they believe in God, but their perception about God and his working through the universe is a bit distorted. So that's what they, they believe that yes, there is a God and he created the heavens and all that, and he's all powerful and everything. But they separate the God from his creation. And when I read this, I I related to some points. Because at, at, at some point in time, we, we think that uh, God has created the world, and, but things are happening just randomly. If you have such thinking, then you, 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 you have a distorted perception of God. This is a deist um, way of thinking. But in, in the true biblical teaching, it teaches that when God created the universe, and he's above everything, and he chooses whatever that he wants to do, he is also concurrent with his universe. He, he, he is involved in, in, in the creation. He's involved in what he has created. He's involved in the life of those who, who he has called for his purpose. He is involved in the life of those who, who trust him. So things are not just happening randomly. That is the second point that you should, you should have. You should know that God is concurrent. And the, the situation that I find myself in, it's not just as a result of something random that I did. That is if you really trust me, if you are really doing your best to, to listen or, and to live by his principles. You should know this principle as well that, well, I'm doing good and all that, but God is also playing some role in my life, which I may not know. So, if we keep this principle in mind, it should help us to um, appreciate and understand why some things happen to us at the same time, at, at some point in time. Things are not happening randomly. Last week, um, a woman spoke of um, some church members who were going for a wedding and they had an accident and um, the, the, the preacher who was ill at that time, someone was taking care of that preacher. Uh, the person who was taking care of that preacher also was involved in that accident and all that. So, some of these things make us wonder whether God is really in control, whether God is, is really powerful as he says he is. But in, certain, in such instances, we should know that God is concurrent in our lives. He, 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 he shapes some of the things that happen in our lives. Some things happen that we can't understand. So we should just happen that it's God's doing. And we should just trust and obey because there is no other way for us. So some few scriptures for the concurrence is um, we can read Ephesians 1 11, Colossians 1 17, Hebrews 1 3. Philippians 2, 13, Psalm 75, verse 5 to 6, Proverbs 3 to 1, 1, Ezra 1, 1, and Ezra 6 to 2. So let's read a few of them all together. Ephesians 1, 11, Colossians 1, 17. Ephesians 1, 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things under the counsel of his will. Okay, so God works all things at the counsel of his will. So 
we are living our lives here, but we do not know exactly what God is um, preparing us and shaping us and molding us for. But we should believe that in times of difficulties, we should believe that while I've done my best to live a good life with God, and this thing is happening to me, but I believe that God has good plans and He will work things according to His own counsel and His own purpose. Then the next one is Colossians 1 17. Colossians 1 17. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Okay, so in Him all things hold together. So in Christ, everything is, is made to, 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 to. All things hold together in Christ. So in times of difficulties, we shouldn't think that it's something that God didn't expect it to happen to us. And now that it has happened, God should find a way and just come and take us out of it or something like that. that if we have that kind of mindset, then we are doing this. We are separating God from his creation. But if we do our best in every penny, then we find difficulties. We should have this in mind, that God is so working, and he's the one who holds everything in this universe. He keeps everything going. So that is the second principle of concurrency. The third one that we should also know is that at times when, um, when we face difficulties, we should know that it could be God's voice. It could be God's voice. And God could be telling us that we are not invincible. It could be God's voice. And God could be telling us that we are not invincible. He says that sometimes prosperity can take us away from the very provider of that prosperity. Sometimes prosperity can take us away from the very provider of that prosperity. Sometimes, um, when we find ourselves in the poor times, what well, that it happens to me. That is why we begin to be the most spiritual aspects of ourselves. When we really want God to do something for us, that is when we really start to pray continuously. We fast at times and all those things. So sometimes God may bring some of these things to us. So that it, it could be as a motivation for us. Because if you are a Christian and you are living a good life and everything is going all on well for you, there is a the tendency for you to think that, well, it's because I'm living, it's because of the life that I'm living, that's why things are going on well for me. And, well, we, we may think of ourselves as invisible beings. We may think that it's because of my own power, um, uh, uh, it's because of my own intellect. That's why I'm able to do this. But if we find ourselves in difficulties, that is when we see that, oh, I'm powerless. I need someone who is powerful enough so that I can depend on him, so that he can take me away from this. So, as we read 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 to 10 the other time, when Paul prayed. So, if you look at the history of Paul, Paul was a very great, before his, he, he became a Christian. He was quite intensive. He, had, uh, he was intelligent, he, had, you know, he was doing very well. But when he became Christ, a Christian, um, he says that God, uh, sorry, Satan put a flesh, a thorn in his flesh. And that was what kept Paul, I am sure it's one of the reasons why Paul um, was always on God, trying to pray to him so that God would take away that from him. So, in some way, God uses some of these things to tell us that we are not invincible. We are just mere mortal human beings. And we need someone who is powerful, someone who is all knowing to, to help us with some of our difficulties. Um, when COVID um, hit the wall, we saw people dying and all that. People were dying, Christians and non Christians, and people began to wonder whether it's from God or whether God really hears our prayers or not. So, one reason that I believe that God let COVID hit us is that it is to show us that we, we don't have any power. Sometimes we, we think that because um, we are able to do certain things and because we have certain knowledge and certain technological advances, we think that we are on our own. But sometimes God lets some of these things happen so that 
it, it exposes us. It exposes us so that we, we get to know that we, 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 we are not in the We are just mere mortal beings. So um, in 1863, um, Abraham Lincoln, which was, who was the president of the US at that time, March 30, he declared a national fast day that that day they should fast and pray. And in his uh, proclamation, this is uh, a brief portion of it. He says that we have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, war, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings that we that were produced, we that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the Lord that we have said. So sometimes when things are okay, we, we, we tend to forget that we depend on God. So sometimes some of these things happen so that God tells us that we are not on our own. We depend on Him, so we should go back and um, depend on Him. Sometimes the death of some people speaks to us when we go to funerals and others. It could hit you that someday it could me over there. So these are all ways that God um, uses to, to speak to us. I remember some few weeks ago I called my mother and she said that she was traveling to the funeral of um, her brother. So I wished him to stay in the morning. So after the call, it just hit me that she said the funeral of her brother. So I started thinking that well, then it means some time will come when I also get a call. <laughs> or I also call someone and tell the person that I'm going to the funeral of my brothers. So some of these things happen so that we, we tend to appreciate how frail we are. So we shouldn't take um, difficulties as solely by things, but sometimes they, they serve as certain reminders for us. Then the last principle over there is that we are limited. We are finite and God is infinite. So uh, we should keep this in mind that we are limited. Sometimes we, we plan our path and we expect that things will go according to that path. Not factoring the external sources in way. So last week we, we got to, since I think people I brought up a point that we should have this kind of mindset that, well, this is what I want. This is what I wish God would do for me. But even if he doesn't do it for me, I'm still going to praise him. Sometimes we leave that caveat out. We trust in God and we believe in God that things will be all right, that um, this difficulty that I'm facing, um, God is going to take me out of it. But we should know that we are finite and we are limited. And we should have in mind that even if God doesn't, it's what happened that, that that's not what God wants for us. So if that happens, and even if God doesn't take us out from that, we will still stay true to Him. So these are some of the things that we should keep in mind. We should always remember that God is sovereign. We should always remember that God is so involved in His creation. We should always remember that sometimes Difficult times are, are God's voice to us, telling us that we, sh we are not on our own. I should depend on Him. And we should also remember the fact that we are finite and we do not know what may happen. And if we keep these things in mind, they will help us. So, the last aspect of this level is that um, after the knowledge that we have about all these things, we should also seek help. In difficult times. So that is why, that's one of the reasons why the church was established. So that we would have a lot of people with a lot of experiences and with a lot of um, capabilities and who may have 
certain um, things that we may be in need of. So um, if we have this in mind and if we seek help from the church, it will also be of a great help to us. Because that's how the church was designed to be. We read from Romans 12, 15 that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So some of these supports are, are, are needed in times of difficulties. In Acts chapter 2, we read that some people sold their uh, the, the things that they had to help others in difficult times. So the church is there for this purpose. So we should also have in mind that when we face difficult times, we should try and make members of the church aware because they will have certain um, things that could be vital for our survival in, in that state. So that should be the end. Our time is up. There's this last bit. So reasons for rewards for steadfastness. Why should we be steadfast? Why should we endure to the end? So the first reason is that if we want to be safe, we should endure to the end. Um, we should also know that in times of difficulties, that is the time that God takes his time to mold and prepare us for certain things that may be ahead of us. So, um, the third one is also good that it points others to God. If you're able to stand certain difficulties, you read from Daniel chapter 6, verse 24, that after Daniel was able to stand in the poor time, um, the king, he died to claim that the God of Daniel should be worshipped. So, if we're able to do that, it also points others who may not be unbelievers to God. It shows our loyalty and faith in God, and it is our responsibility as Christians. To persevere to the end. So that is the end of this virtue of perseverance. So I will end here if anyone has any question. Thank you. Thank you. Vincent.
Probably we are doing well in our lives, in our spiritual journey, we are very well. But there could be some weaknesses in us that sometimes our expectations come and reveal them to us. Thank you very much. So that was one of the principles that we should know that we are not invincible. We could be living good lives, but there could be some question marks somewhere. So um, Job chapter 4, so this is what Job said at the end. He said that. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that Christ comes from without knowledge? Therefore, I have thwarted what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. So later on, he realized that he said something that he shouldn't have. Is there an opinion that? So from from all that you have, and by the way, thank you for the job. Um, perseverance, like all these spiritual virtues, do not happen in a flash. And there is no tail at the drugstore that is able to perseverance. So what no you call your man was that is now persevering. It comes with some responsibility. It, it has to be fine. That's it. So, um, as young people, we should rethink some of the things that we have internalized. Um, there is, you cannot persevere without knowledge. You cannot persevere without internalizing um, some of the things that we have, um, we have been discussing in. And so, if you are a Christian and certain things happen to you, perhaps that is God trying to um, allow you to demonstrate the, the level of perseverance that you have. And so, we should not see challenges and difficulties as anti uh, Christianity. I didn't think I'm your piece to be now. Or how or how. Oh, but since help us all, oh, we are the other way. Remember now, we are the way about bodybuilding. What do you do? I have to be in the way. Moses. So if you have to get a weight for you to build your muscle, then you have to invent certain spiritual ways for you to learn spiritual perseverance. So, oh my God, what's that way? And to it, and you have to catch it and say, "Just do so much in my name." It's it's not the case. Thank you. Thank you. So, if there are no other comments or questions, we pray that God will bless the hearing of His word and illumine our minds and our hearts. Thank you. God will bless the hearing of His word and He will grant us the spirit so that we be able to persevere. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Please, shall we be outstanding as we take our place?
long time before you know. We shall sing the first, the second, the fifth, and then the last time. Lord, we come before Lord, we come. One, go. Lord, we